tonight, tension and uncertainty in Hong Kong. We're right here as protesters and police vie for control. Will new protests bring tougher responses? Right in the midst of the hurricane. A Category 5 monster slams the Bahamas. Now millions along the U.S. East Coast wait and worry. Where will Dorian head next? It's overdue for a tweaking and a revision. And new labor rules in effect today, countrywide around vacation, work flexibility and breaks. But why is there so much confusion on day one? This is The National. It's now Monday here in Hong Kong. What in any normal September would be the first day of school, but this city left normal behind a long time ago. Behind me, despite a tropical cyclone, organizers are setting up for another rally. Any hopes the arrest of prominent pro-democracy figures might tamp down tensions were proven wrong. They're not done. Still angling to get the globe talking, the Hong Kong airport was once more the destination. Disruption, the angry ambition. 13 weeks in, the goals and methods of this movement shift. Initially, a fight over an extradition bill. Now it's demands for universal suffrage and accountability for police brutality. Surrounding the airport caused road and rail closures. More frenzy, more destruction. It gets worse by the week. Outside, people on the highway were forced to walk with their luggage towards flights that in some cases were canceled. Some were livid, a few of the inconvenienced understanding. It is definitely disturbed, but I think um, it's respectable because they're trying to do what the, what's best for them. The airport blockade was short-lived but intense. Then different pockets of protesters clashed with police throughout the city. The entire weekend has been one of escalation. Saturday, before midnight, a subway station was besieged after reports of scuffles between protesters and other passengers. Police searched. Cops pulling out and beating some. Pepper spray shot right into faces. The cries of this young couple alarmed many. We reached out to a woman who was there, not a protester. She maintains a passenger. Okay, perfect. She got as many pictures as she could, says she was there when the couple were struck. They kneel down in front of the cops, begging them not to come in place. We are leaving. Then the cops still shoot them with pepper spray directly into the eyes. As we spoke, a man leaned in a little too close to listen. So lots of people are listening, right? And we moved around a couple times to get away from, from cameras. I don't know how to differentiate people in Hong Kong now if they are supporters of police or supporters of protesters. I just feel very unsafe. That's how many Hong Kongers feel now. One more image from last night still haunts many today. A medic begging to be led into the subway to help people the police turning him away. As police continue to refuse, and the crowd rages, he gives up. This is a city of both stamina and real strain. And now, Andrew, we have student strikes and a general strike, both called for today. Right, and Adrian, I, I guess the, the question there is what's expected to happen? Well, there is this threat of this looming siphon, uh, typhoon, which is, you know, you can't ignore that factor, but this is the day many thought the protests would fizzle out because it is Monday, it is supposed to be the start of school, but permits have been granted for all three strikes, this high school strike, a college strike, 
and a general strike. So obviously they expect it, the authorities anyway, to be peaceful. Whether the metro or the airport get disrupted again, that really isn't clear. Mm. And, and what do we know about how Beijing is responding or, or plans to respond? All of well, Chinese state media has issued a statement that seems on the face of it really to be pretty serious, saying the end is near. And interestingly, it's issued three red lines that it insists must not be crossed. No one should harm China's sovereignty or security. No one should challenge the power of the central authorities. No one should use Hong Kong to infiltrate and then undermine the mainland. So what exactly is the threat? It's not entirely clear, but of course the worry for people involved in the protests or in the people just living here is that it might mean military force. Okay, Adrian, you uh, take care of yourself. And Adrian will have more from Hong Kong. She had a chance to follow volunteer medics who've seen with their own eyes the danger level on the streets go up. That's in about 15 minutes' time. Okay, right now, Hurricane Dorian is practically parked over the Bahamas, and that's what makes it so dangerous. The catastrophic Category 5 storm barely moving forward as it hammers people there. It made landfall right around lunchtime and has been crawling westward ever since. Folks, I'm in Marsh Harbor. And right now, we experience it basically right in the midst of the hurricane. When it crashed ashore Great Abaco Island, the winds were gusting over 350 kilometers an hour. Think about how fast that is. Buildings just broke apart. This one lost its roof, even as people rode out the storm inside. Everyone pray for us, please. Please pray for us. A life-threatening storm surge pushed a wall of water inland. Folks tried to find safety in schools, churches, emergency shelters. Others did not. And as the storm hit today, this message from their prime minister. That I hope this is not the last time they would hear my voice. I'm devastated. In areas that Dorian has now left behind, destruction. But it's far from over. This gigantic storm is forecast to sit over the Bahamas until Monday, then head towards the U.S. Now, exactly where it could hit the U.S., or if it will at all, isn't yet totally clear. The projected paths have Hurricane Dorian turning northeast once it's past the Bahamas and following the coastline up, which means people right up to the Carolinas are preparing for the worst tonight. Now, David Common is in Florida, and sure enough, people there are right in the middle of last-minute hurricane preps. It may look like a beach paradise right now, but Sean Wiedeber is preparing for tomorrow, gathering sand in grocery bags to keep surging storm water out of his home. I'll put them in my back door by the pool and in the front door. and um, Try to stop any of that water stop, yeah. from getting in. We did about two years ago and it helped with the water. How many of these bags do you have to do? I'll probably do about 100. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. You got a lot of work ahead of you. I got a lot of work ahead Better of Better leave you to it. Across Florida, the final push to protect is on. The eye of Dorian may not make landfall here, but even a side swipe could be devastating. The storm advancing slowly, giving it time to pummel buildings. Just preparations key. Uh, as long as you got the supplies that you need and just help people out when they need it, and that's pretty much it. Joe, don't panic, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Now, trailer parks are often those most at risk because there's no foundations. This one has largely been abandoned. Many people have just got out, moved inland. This guy here has not only put up the corrugated metal on top of the windows, but he's actually strapped down the whole roof in the hopes that it won't blow away. Many have seen all this before. Previous storms etched into repeatedly used plywood. But where and how and when exactly Dorian will bring it isn't exact making it a challenge for coastal Floridians to decide whether to stay or go. You know, they keep changing the, the, the track and it's, it's just hard to tell. So we just want to be ready. In fact, hurricane projections are wrong about a third of the time, though as it gets closer, there is greater certainty. One thing that's happening is we are noticing that the wind field is expanding. Uh, it's getting stronger. The wind field is expanding, which is not a good combination. Absolutely life-threatening, devastating. Among the property owners of Florida is the president himself, whose Mar-a-Lago resort is in the path of hurricane-strength winds, and who today spoke of Dorian's sheer size. I'm not sure that I've ever even heard of a Category 5. I knew it existed, 
and I've seen some Category 4s. You don't even see them that much, but a Category 5 is something that uh, I don't know that I've ever even heard the term. Of course, the term has been used, including right here in Florida just last year, Hurricane Michael, a Cat 5. And tonight, once again, Floridians are getting ready. You see that the streets are relatively quiet around us. All the buildings seem to be boarded up. If you aren't prepared yet, you probably aren't going to be. Right. OK, David, and, and where you are is where the wind should hit first on the U.S. mainland. How, how sure are we about how that forecasted track will actually play out? So the models really are, Andrew, just projections. There's no guarantees about them. And even the top meteorologists are saying the slightest deviation in steering could push this storm right through the center of the entire state or perhaps northwards towards Georgia, the Carolinas, even Virginia. David Common, stay safe tonight. And a note to that, tonight, South Carolina's governor ordered a mandatory evacuation of the state's coast effective noon on Monday. Okay, Texas is in the eye of a political storm tonight, one that's become sadly familiar in the United States. The backdrop, seven people dead, more than 20 hurt in the state's latest shooting rampage this weekend. Carolyn Dunn takes us through a terrifying chain of events and also how it's added more fuel to the debate over gun control. The gunman first turned his sight on state troopers during a traffic stop before speeding off and aiming his assault rifle at dozens more. And he had a very large gun and it was pointing at me. Hear gunshots. It was at least 10 shots. Okay, I got one on my door and one went through, ricocheted right here through my wrist. The gunman continued his mobile attack for more than 30 kilometers, ending up at a mall. We're just seeing people oh, we're, we're, running through the mall right now. There's something going on over here. We're not sure what's going we're on. There are sure people Jay, running through that. the mall. A local TV station there was forced to halt okay, its live broadcast and evacuate when armed police rushed in. So we're going to walk back on here and get you up today. Get out, get out, get out. Police finally shot the gunman dead in a parking lot. They're still investigating a motive, but they say they have no reason to believe it was an act of domestic terrorism. Odessa's police chief refused to utter the gunman's name. I'm not going to give him any notoriety for what he did. But as they searched his Odessa home, authorities identified him as 36-year-old Seth Ator. On the campaign trail, Texan and Democratic presidential nomination hopeful Beto O'Rourke didn't even try to hide his disdain. Oh, we do know this is tough. Yeah. We do know we do know there is no reason that we have to accept this as our fortune, as our future. While U.S. President Donald Trump downplayed any prospects of universal background checks. For the most part, as strong as you make your background checks, they would not have stopped any of it. Keep those who have fallen in your prayers. But as many Texans attend a vigil tonight for those killed and injured, they must also wrestle with the fact that it's just a matter of time before there will be another mass shooting in the U.S. Perhaps even in their own state again. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Washington. Now, as you've been hearing again and again, all of this has become disturbingly familiar ground for Texas. In five mass shootings there in just the past two years, more than 70 people were killed. The governor today issued a call to action, but it comes with one big condition. We need solutions that will keep guns out of the hands of criminals like the killer here in Odessa, while also ensuring that we safeguard Second Amendment rights. And we must do it fast. Now, Greg Abbott's comments come on the same day Texas actually relaxed its gun laws. The timing is coincidental, planned a while ago. But as of today, firearms can be brought into places of worship, schools, and foster homes. Landlords also can't evict gun owners just for being gun owners. Okay, other stories we are watching this Sunday night on The National. Hezbollah fired anti-tank missiles at an Israeli army base and Israel fired back at targets in southern Lebanon. Israel has been on high alert for a possible confrontation after Hezbollah claimed Israeli drones attacked a suspected missile facility near Beirut last week.
Taliban fighters attacked a village in northern Afghanistan today. It follows a deadly day in the city of Kunduz, where 20 members of the security force and five civilians were killed. Despite the violence, a U.S. official says they're close to a deal with the Taliban to negotiate a peace agreement. We can't allow China to rip us off anymore as a country. And new U.S. tariffs on $112 billion worth of Chinese goods kicked in today. In return, China has imposed a tariff on $75 billion worth of U.S. goods, including crude oil. Despite all of this, this ratcheting up of the trade war, Donald Trump insists talks will still happen later this month. Well, just in time for Labor Day, there's a new set of rules in effect in workplaces across Canada, affecting almost a million people. The goal is to provide a better work-life balance, but a number of businesses aren't happy about the way things are changing. And it's not even altogether clear exactly who has to follow these new rules and who doesn't. Talia Ricci tried to get some answers today. On the eve of Labor Day parades across the country, a new set of rules for employers in federally regulated businesses and industries. It's overdue for a tweaking and a revision. These federal labor standards affect around 18,000 employers and more than 900,000 employees across the country. In industries like transportation, grain handling, banking and broadcasting, including the CBC. Some of the notable revisions include a new personal leave of up to five days, a leave for victims of family violence of up to 10 days, new breaks and rest periods, and the chance for flexible work arrangements. These are designed to make the work, working conditions better and certainly to make for a better work-life balance. But the Canadian Federation of Independent Business says the regulations are confusing and just don't work for jobs that fall outside the typical 9 to 5 day, like trucking. It's calling on the government to slow down the whole process. There's a, a laundry list of businesses, including some with small and medium sized companies involved that are going to have to try to accommodate a whole confusing mess of new changes. Exemptions will be allowed. WestJet says it's looking for one, but many companies are unclear on whether they qualify. They want certainty, they want to understand what they're expected to do. In a statement, the Minister of Labour says, We recognize that not all workplaces are alike, and in May 2019 began consultations on new regulations that will exempt certain classes of employees from the new hours of work provisions. These regulations will be in place in 2020. Until then, she said, the old rules apply to some classes of employees. This is, I think, an attempt by the Liberal Party to portray itself as a friend of working people, a friend of middle-class Canadians. New rules just in time for Labour Day and weeks before a federal election. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Now, when it comes to workers' rights, here's a sobering thought for you. One group estimates that nearly 25 million people around the world are victims of forced labor, essentially modern-day slavery. And when you buy fish from China, Russia, Spain, or Thailand, there's some chance it's a product of that. Tonight, Karen Paul speaks to a man who lived and worked that reality firsthand. My passport was uh, confiscated by the captain and I wasn't allowed to leave. This 45-year-old Cambodian man worked on Thai fishing boats for nearly 30 years. The last one was the worst. We spoke to him on Skype from Phnom Penh using a translator. I was working day and night and I only got one hour of rest. He saw his co-workers abused and says none of them were paid. He finally escaped when his boat went into a Malaysian port. Men are uh, forced to stay on boats because of threats of violence, uh, because of debts hanging over their heads. This Canadian lawyer helps exploited fishermen get justice. When people think about human trafficking, they do think about uh, sex trafficking, but we know from the data around the world that, that forced labor trafficking is actually a much larger problem. Andrei Sodchenko's office was involved in a landmark conviction in May. A Cambodian national convicted of trafficking five men was sentenced to nine years in prison and ordered to pay about $15,000 to each victim. 
According to the 2018 Global Slavery Index, Canada ranked the sixth highest for annual imports of goods at risk of being produced through modern slavery. I asked the Canadian government to lean on uh, its government partners around the world so that governments around the world are really protecting the most vulnerable workers. I'm rather hoping that over the course of the next uh, two months that this might uh, occupy some political space. Last December, this Ontario Liberal MP tabled a private member's bill. The Modern Slavery Act would require Canadian companies to file an annual statement saying they're satisfied their supply chain doesn't involve child or forced labour. That bill will die when Parliament is dissolved for the fall election, but John McKay says if he's re-elected, he'll reintroduce it. I have a faith in Canadians, a belief in Canadians, that uh, they would, if given the choice, buy products and use uh, goods and services that are made in conditions that are not slave-like conditions. Back in Phnom Penh, the Cambodian man just has one message for Canadians. All of the workers are you know, working hard, they're going through hardships, and I would love to see them rescue. Something to think about the next time you shop for seafood. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. And still ahead on The National, why this year's slow wildfire season in B.C. doesn't mean things are actually necessarily slowing down. But first, Adrian takes us to the streets of Hong Kong for a closer look at the protests and those who are working to keep them safe. Is it escalating the sort of injuries you're seeing? Well, that is definitely escalating. You know, it's because, you know, um, they're now firing at people's heads. <laughs> This is what pressure in Hong Kong looks like. Protesters rushing to block and sometimes to break. Police rushing in pursuit, sometimes on the attack. After 13 weeks of this, no one is immune to rage, suspicion or anguish. Every day seems to bring more fire and more force. A dynamic we look at now in depth. Covering the protests this weekend was to witness the pro-democracy movement slogan, Be Water in Action, fluid. Tactics changing, the aims the same. According to volunteer medics, meanwhile, police are aiming higher for the head. The weekend had barely begun when the first signals came, it might get ugly. This is an authorized religious gathering, but look at that crowd. When the Hong Kong government banned a protest from happening, the angry started mingling here, hoping they'd be safe one way or another, make themselves hurt. We don't know when and where the police will file tear gas. And even we didn't, we had do nothing that's harmful to the police, but they still will fight citizens. So uh, we need to protect ourselves. Within moments, they notice a yellow flag is up. That's a warning from the police. Flags here move from yellow to black before the tear gas and worse, get fired. That agitated. So they move and grow, thousands heading towards the seats of power in Hong Kong. This is police headquarters. Every chant you hear is an insult hurled at the cops. And remember, none of these people are technically supposed to be out on these streets today. The protest that was planned for today was banned and then it was cancelled. But what's happening here is that when the people are told no, it just seems to make them angrier. This is a leaderless movement, no published plans. Protesters don't linger. So tracking them is hard. That's all by design. It keeps them safer, but only if these people can stay on top of it. They're the volunteer medics who feel they have to be right at the front. The split screen, those are all live shots of different pockets of protest. Which is the biggest concern to you right now? We don't actually know where exactly they'll be because uh, they're pretty random, they don't have a set plan. They usually uh, adjust according to what's happening around them and where they might encounter police violence or, you know, um, any, <coughs> or a police defense line. Uh, if that happens, usually a, fright, a fight breaks out. These are nurses, med students, and they've been doing this for weeks. Is it escalating the sort of injuries you're seeing? Well, uh, that is definitely escalating. You know, it's because, you know, um, they're now firing at people's heads. 
Many believe it was police who hit a female medic in the eye a few weeks ago. I never thought that would be happen, but this is really happening right now, actually. So um, I can only say that um, it's quite disappointing, and uh, you just wouldn't know what people can will do. They head out towards the subway into building crowds. The pace of the protest is picking up and it's shifting. See the clusters hiding something behind their umbrellas? These are the more hardcore protesters who come with Molotov cocktails and plans to fight. You were saying that, that a lot of these frontline protesters, they've really written their last yes, wills? Yes, that's true, that's true, that's true. Because, you know, um, you know I, as we said before, the police shot them at the head, right? So you never know who is going to be the first one to get killed. And so it turns. The tear gas, rubber bullets, and blue dye to make it easier to find the protesters. Until now, violence hasn't typically happened until nightfall, but the intensity of everything is building. A few hours later, another neighborhood. The families and elderly are gone, the young and furious remain. Do your parents know where you are? Uh, yes. Oh, no, no, and no. Are they okay with that? Uh, yes. How, how prepared are you to keep fighting? Like, at what cost? Um, they, they are us, us, them, us, us to leave. Changing direction and plans always. It can be a little bit hard to figure out what the protesters are up to. See how they're all advancing in this direction? It's not because they're fleeing something. It's because they've organically decided they've been here in central Hong Kong for a little bit too long, and now they're heading towards the causeway. No rushing or awareness that it's about to change. Riot police charge, firing rubber bullets as they run. Seconds later, it's clear someone is down. From the work the medics do, it seems the protesters has a head wound and he's unconscious. The crowd across the street gets livid. Rage about the heavy hand of police fuels many of the protests. Insults fly, gangsters, dogs, and worse. Loaded into the ambulance, but it's not over. The police are off to another neighborhood. No matter what authorities thought would happen when they banned a protest, force only seems to fuel this movement. And so the National will be right here over the coming days watching what is next for Hong Kong. Yes, indeed we will. Meantime, we also want to tell you about the new season of The National launching tomorrow. We've all been very hard at work digging into the stories that matter to you, trying to get answers. And so here's a preview of what you'll see in the weeks to come. So if you have to be out in three days and you don't have a place to go, where will you go? So you had to get your planes back home and on the ground. And how long did that take? How did Toronto lose Kauai? How did you lose Kauai? What's the issue that will really be important to hear more about? How consistent are umpires? Why is it so important to the TTC to be so open? Even giving us this kind of time. And I remember getting up off my seat, slamming an emergency, screaming, no! Death on the tracks. It's a devastating reality and it's only getting worse. And it's why Toronto's Transit Commission is taking the extraordinary step of talking about it. Charlottetown's vacancy rate is basically zero, close to the tightest rental market in the entire country. A place where the phrase renoviction is now commonplace. So what's the plan, Jill? Beach finds himself not only having to defend the government's approval of the pipeline, but also its decision to purchase it outright. This in spite of the fact that Beach knows most of his riding is against the project and he did his best to stop it from happening. I can tell you what's striking about it is how quickly the computer can make the call. Watch this. Ball. It's actually that fast. So what role does the umpire still have? For three days, WestJet, like other airlines, continued to carry passengers on their MAX 8s. For the first time, Wilson is speaking publicly about why they kept using the jets. We look at things from a data perspective. We look at it from our knowledge of the training, our knowledge of what the fault was. Can you take me to that moment when it worked, when you won? Africa won, you know, uh, Canada won. 
Yeah, and that, that was very important. Selfishly, I say that, you know. We prove to people that you, ain't have to, you don't have to come from a certain place uh, to win. Thank you very, very much, Chris. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. In just over a year, U.S. voters will decide whether to give Donald Trump another term in the Oval Office. The time he's already spent there has been full of divisive politics that some say are creating a divided country. But as veteran journalist Dan Rather pointed out when we sat down for a chat, this isn't the first period of upheaval in the United States. Far from it. And it probably won't be the last. So tonight, we revisit our conversation. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. A man named Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, Dan Rather has covered some of the most important news events of our time. Thank you, Mr. President. Dan Rather with CBS News. He's been a reporter. The has been hitting full force. A correspondent on 60 Minutes. And that's the way it is. And replaced the legendary Walter Cronkite when he became the face of CBS Evening News. Good evening. Freddie, how much copy you got there? Huh? He anchored for an astounding 24 years. And it was a career that could very well have ended when he was removed from the anchor desk over a story that pitted his reporting against the Bush administration. And to each of you. But he was defiant then. Courage. And certainly hasn't stopped telling stories since. Today, he's got a lot to say about the state of American politics, and his latest project is called Human Nature. Should you be allowed to make a genetic change into the next generation that will then go on to other generations? It's a documentary about a scientific breakthrough in genetic engineering. As this field advances, people will be able to order a change in their genetic makeup to create an outcome of interest to them. I met up with Dan Rather in Toronto. Mr. Rather, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you very much for having me. And I, I guess safe to say you feel very strongly that gene editing may be one of the most important developments of our lifetimes. I mean, t tell me why. I don't think I've ever covered anything that has the potential to be as far reaching and as consequential as this breakthrough, scientific breakthrough. Well, I mean, was there a moment, though, or, or a milestone that the technology had surpassed that, that made you kind of stop and take notice and, and think, this is a, a sort of a holy crap level of technology? <laughs> well, that's exactly what it was, it was a holy crap moment. <laughs> now, I want to emphasize this is still in its infancy. And one of the reasons we made the film, we just aren't having a conversation about this now as we move from the very first front edge of discovery to the full potential of this. I mean, doing away with all kinds of diseases is possible, even somewhere in the distant future, cancer. The upside is terrific, fantastic, but there are some downsides to it. There was um, a particularly striking moment of clarity uh, in the film. And, and funny enough, of all places, it came from, from Vladimir Putin. He's talking about the medical applications, the potential for good. But then he says there is another part that, look, this has the, the potential to change the course of humanity's development. But this may be more terrifying than a nuclear bomb. That is a hell of a thing for a guy to say, especially one who actually has a <laughs> nuclear arsenal at his disposal. You know, I'm smiling because I'm, I'm glad you said that. If we don't have the conversation now, and the conversation has to be with scientists, but much broader than scientists, society as a whole has to decide, do we need to regulate this? And how do you do that? This is the conversation we need to be having with ourselves right now. But are Americans ready to have that conversation? I hope so. That's the best I can say. You know, as, as we talk about this, which, which is a massive issue in, in scope and importance, and the backdrop, which is the world, and, and, and I think because I'm speaking with you, uh, someone who has a lot of experience in American politics, but also American sensibilities, 
if I could ask you, just sort of in a broad sense, what is happening in America right now? We're going through a very difficult period, a very perilous period of transition that started in 1965 when we reformed our immigration laws. We expanded that into opening, open immigration around the world. Now, as a result of that, we are a, a significantly different people now in terms of demographics that we were. We were a greater mix. I personally think we're much better for it. But because our demographics have changed so greatly, the culture itself has changed. And this scares a lot of people. And the fright that that has produced, the fear that that has produced, has those of us who are Americans asking ourselves the questions now of who are we, what, it, what are our core values, what is it we believe, and that's now being decided. And how does the man at the top, Donald Trump, fit into that? Well, Donald Trump recognized that so many people had fears, deep-seated fears. Many of them would never express these fears. Many of them tried to cloak their fears about the, what they see as the rapid change in the culture of the society and the democratic makeup. And he has sought to, and so far has succeeded to a certain degree, in exploiting those fears. And because he is not a president who defends our institutions, he attacks our institutions, he attacks the courts, he attacks the other branches of government, and he attacks the press, not just individual press people or press organizations, but called everybody in the press, quote, enemies of the people. That's where he fits in. I ask you about Donald Trump because you, you have, I think, a particular insight into the kind of person he is, and that's through your work. And could I, so I, so I actually just want to show you something, and it's a piece of reporting that, that you did. All right. um, this is from 20 years ago, thanks. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I remember the piece very well. You remember the piece? I, so I just, want, I just want to show you just the first part of this. If there would be a poster boy to represent America at the turn of the millennium, the celebration of celebrity, the rich almost reeking of prosperity, continuing proof that the American dream exists, then Donald Trump's picture might best fill the frame. His name is on buildings, his face is in magazines and newspapers. Both are on the covers of three previous books, all bestsellers, and now he's coming out with a fourth. But this time, he's not talking only about his prowess to make millions of dollars. Now, he is also talking about his hope to win millions of voters. That's right, New York City developer Donald Trump says he wants to be President of the United States. Well, that was a piece that I did for 60 minutes. Did you take him seriously at the time? No. I, did not take, I didn't take his running for president seriously because our reporting revealed that what he was really doing at that time was selling uh, golf club memberships and condominium apartments. It was part of his, a, a giant publicity campaign for him. Now, there wasn't any doubt in my mind that he was thinking maybe long run running for president. But I will say that I never thought at that time that even at some future decade where Donald Trump, if he was to run for president, uh, that he would come anywhere close to winning. I'm very worried about the country now, that I'm an optimist by nature and by experience. And I also know, having been graced with a long life and knowing what I know about history, that we Americans have been through a lot before. We have to steady ourselves and we have to dig deep back into our history, remind ourselves of what unites us. We still have core values that unites us. But uh, I'm op optimistic for the long pull. In the short and medium term, I think it's going to be pretty tough. Mr. Rather, thanks so much for your time. Thank it was you wonderful very much. I appreciate it greatly. Thank Cheers. you. And still ahead on The National, after record-breaking years, why this year's wildfire season in BC has been cool so far. Let's take advantage of this down year, uh, get a lot of good work done, and be prepared for the future, which is just, unfortunately, more fire.
I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, Pulitzer Prize-winning writer David Shribman talks to us about Rosalie Abella, a judge who's been called Canada's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. People in British Columbia entered 2019 dreading another year of record-breaking forest fires. Parts of the province were devastated by vicious back-to-back fire seasons. But this year has brought some surprising relief. CBC's Tanya Fletcher has been looking into why that is. We've had enough burnt up around here without any more. 84-year-old Ken Ebert runs the Evergreen Fishing Resort. Nestled along Loon Lake in B.C.'s southern interior, it's been in his family for six decades and counting. But back-to-back record-breaking wildfire seasons leveled the area, including six of the resort's cabins. Then this year, finally some relief. Thankfully, like I say, this one, this summer now, it's been um, mild, uh, more rain and, and not as hot. The dramatic scenes he witnessed on the ground were also seen from space and they're reflected in the numbers too. Records were shattered in 2017 when more than 1,300 wildfires scorched B.C. at a cost of $650 million. In 2018, even more forest fires, 2,100 with a price tag of $615 million. But 2019 has seen a third, not even 700 fires so far, barely totaling $100,000. Definitely a a very different look to many parts of the province this year as compared to the last two. In fact, the province says it's been so slow this year, fire crews from B.C. have been redeployed to help elsewhere. We had uh, hundreds and hundreds of personnel in Alberta, and we've also had personnel go to Yukon, uh, Ontario, as well as the state of Alaska. The sudden halt to B.C.'s fire season has caught many by surprise. The big question, why? The main reason, the weather. Uh, This year uh, didn't quite pan out the way the models projected. This fire ecologist says cooler temperatures and more rain put a damper on the typically hot and dry conditions. And he would know he inspects those conditions on a daily basis in the forest. This is where a lot of our heat from the fires comes from. It's from the surface. He says mitigation work, like getting rid of the fire fuel on the forest floor, will help prevent more fires, not if, but when they spark up again. Let's take advantage of this down year, uh, get a lot of good work done, and be prepared for the future, which is just, unfortunately, more fire. Yeah, that... For Ken Ebert back in Loon Lake, that message is unwelcome, but not unexpected. He knows the fires may be a force they'll have to continue fighting. We're just not giving up, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. And when we come back, an emotional moment at the U.S. Open. She told me that I did amazing and good luck, and then she asked if I could do an encore interview with her, and I said no because I knew I was going to cry the whole time, but she encouraged me to do it. <laughs> what happens when the defending champ meets a rising star? That's next in our moment. There's been another poignant show of sportsmanship and grace on the women's tennis circuit. At the U.S. Open yesterday, Naomi Osaka beat 15-year-old Coco Goff, slamming the brakes on the teen's glorious breakout season. But it's what happened next that people can't stop talking about, when Osaka chose to share her spotlight with her rival. And tonight, that is our moment. Maybe playing a 15-year-old and not wanting to lose to a 15-year-old. There it is. Okay, set match. Just Just too much game. Coco, this crowd absolutely loves you. Wipe those tears away. Tell us what Naomi told you at the net. Um, She told me that I did amazing and good luck, and then she asked if I could do an on-court interview with her, and I said no because I knew I was going to cry the whole time, but she encouraged me to do it. Once again, thank you, Naomi. I don't want people to think that I'm trying to take this moment away from her because she really deserves it, so thank you. I remember I used to see you guys. I don't want to cry. I used to see you guys. Sorry. This is an emotional night, everybody. (laughs) 
remember I used to see you guys training in the same place as us, and for me, like the fact that both of us made it, um, and we're both still working as hard as we can, I think it's incredible. And I think you guys are amazing. I think Coco, you're amazing. Really nice. What sportsmanship. Yeah, what sportsmanship indeed. I can't get enough of this story. And, you know, it's, it's women's tennis more broadly that has been such a shining beacon of this very spirit. Just, just think back a few weeks ago, right, when Canadian Bianca Andreescu beat Serena Williams. Uh, you know, that was devastating for Williams because she had to pull out due to injury, but Andreescu so, so gracious in victory. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to lose with grace. That's impressive. But to win with grace, that's a whole other thing. That's The National for this September 1st. Have a good night.